Welcome again. My name is Bob Gordon. I'm a uh, ministry partner here at Story Hill. Well, thanks, Kennedy. Cut it out. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to uh, just kind of share with you opportun an opportunity that's coming up to serve. As you might know, serving is one of the pillars of Story Hill Church. And a lot of times you think of serving at a church as, as a Sunday morning opportunity in the circle, children's ministry, youth ministry. One of the neat things with Story Hill is we also partner with a number of uh, mission organizations in the community, and we have a chance to come alongside them and serve as well. So we do that with five different mission organizations. One of them is uh, Ada Jenkins, where we serve in the food pantry. Another is Alongside Families, which is an organization that helps keep children out of the foster care system. A uh, third one is the Charlotte Rescue Mission, where we go down monthly and serve a meal and, and have dinner with the, the guests there. And another opportunity is Young Lives, where we provide child care so that uh, teens can be part of Young Life, even if they're teen moms or teen dads. So really cool opportunities. I agree with you on that one, Kennedy. So serving, our partner, not partners, serving with our partners not only helps advance their mission, it allows us to come alongside each other and serve. And that's really one of the things I enjoy the most. So I listed out four, if I'm counting correctly, right? Okay, so there's a fifth one. And that's access to success. Anyone know access to success? Yeah. My friend Aaron is on the staff there. H2S, uh, each, uh, each quarter, so three times, four times a year, doing the math, four times three, yeah. Four times a year we get together and pack boxes that get shipped to Nigeria filled with shoes, socks, clothing that they then use in their ministry to serve the needs of the people in Nigeria. I want to share something that uh, Andrew reminded us. Andrew Lovedale, who founded A2S, is a ministry partner here. And last night we did the uh, A2S Soulful Supper, their annual fundraising event. And he reminded us the, uh, empower the powerful holistic ways that A2S serves the needs of youth, helping educate them and, and providing for basic needs, not only for the kids, but also their families and the communities and the impact that's making in Nigeria. And the beauty is it's all done with the love of Jesus. So on our uh, next serving day, which is November 4th, when is it, Aaron? November 4th, we're gonna gather on a Saturday morning and pack all this stuff into huge boxes that then get packed into a shipping container that then gets shipped to Nigeria and provide for families and kids and basic needs that we, you know, how many times has your kid said, hey, I need a new pair of shoes, dad or mom? And how many times do they actually need those new pair of shoes? That's the question. These kids need the shoes. And it's, it's a great chance to serve with some great people. I, I look around and I see people that I've served with on Saturdays throughout the past couple of years doing this. So again, it's a great way to serve locally, an organization that's making an impact globally and you can sign up or learn more. So a QR code in the back of the chair in front of you. You can use a QR code to find out information about signing up. You can also stop by, we've got a table out front that you can find out about all five of these different ministries and how you can serve. Or if you're watching online, you can also go to the website and look up serve in our community page. So thank you for listening. I hope to see you on November 4th. And if you would stand up, greet the people around you and Tell them what you're most looking forward to this fall. Sorry to interrupt. 
If you could start finding your way to your seats. Oh. Start finding your way to your seat. We will go ahead and get started. I know. Well, once again, welcome. Great to be with everyone. Welcome again to Story Hill on this Sunday morning. My name is Gray. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And today, we are continuing in the series we've called Set Your Hope, which has been going through the books of First and Second Peter, which were were written by Peter, or actually the first Peter was dictated by Peter to his, uh, his friend Silas, who wrote for him. And Peter wrote from Rome uh, to a mostly Gentile Christian audience. Remember that fact. We'll come back to that later. But he wrote from Rome, and he sent this letter across Asia Minor, which you can think of as Turkey. We have a picture up here on the map. Rome is way up there in the top left, and Asia Minor is where I drew that little circle. Lots of churches within that circle this, this letter circulated to. And Peter was writing in, in the mid-60s AD at a time where a man named Nero was the emperor of Rome. You may recognize Nero's name. He was not a guy who was very nice to Christians. He, he ramped up this period of persecution and oppression of Christians. And that's part of why Peter's writing because there's this persecution looming on the horizon for many Christians, and Peter is writing from Rome, encouraging them to have faith and, and to be encouraged in the midst of the suffering that's on the horizon. And we've set this whole passage within one verse in the book of 1 Peter that, that, that we think, we've set this whole series on, the book, on one verse in 1 Peter that we think really sums up what Peter is trying to communicate. It's 1 Peter 1, 13. It says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So in the midst of all the uncertainty, all the fear, all the potential suffering on the way, set your hope on Jesus. That's his primary message. His primary encouragement to Christians is to set your hope on Jesus. And the reality is that each one of them, everyone that Peter was writing to and every one of us, have set our hope on something. We have set our hope on something. And, and I was fascinated this week preparing for this, thinking about this idea of setting your hope. Because there are a lot of different, setting can mean a lot of different things. It can mean like you're, you're setting on top of something. You're setting your, your hope on a foundation that is solid and that will support your hope. So in one sense, we're, we're setting our hope on Jesus. Another sense, it could be like setting, like you set your sights on an instrument. And so you, you set your hope on Jesus, where you're, you're orienting your hope and tuning it to him. There's also this idea of where you, you pour plaster or concrete and you let it set. And so you, you pour it and then you let time and you let the, the concrete itself work itself and set in position to where it would hold fast and be strong. And then lastly, there's another way of setting, and again, the deeper I got, the more interesting I thought this was, where, where when you, if you're in a boat where you, you drop your anchor and you set the anchor, you, you let it dig into the ground, uh, and you almost let it drag across the bottom of, of the ocean to grab a hold of something that will hold in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the trials that may rage overhead. So there are all these different ways of, of, of setting, but I think all of them can be true in, an instance where, in, in a sense where we are, we are placing our weight, placing our trust, placing our future in the hands of Jesus. And so that is, that's the question. Again, I said we all place our hope in something, and so what is it that we have set our hope on? What do we turn to for our hope? To whom or to what do we entrust our future to? And Peter's message is to set our hope in Jesus Christ. And so today we're picking up on chapter four, but would you join me in prayer as we, uh, as we begin? Lord, we thank you for your holy scripture and how it is a way you have, you've given us to know you and understand you and know how to live as people uh, following you. Um, and so, Lord, would you use it to sharpen us, to encourage us, to challenge us, uh, to, to clarify things to us this morning? And would you also uh, give, give us the, the clarity to see um, the gospel in the midst of a passage that asks us to do a lot of things? Lord, help us be convicted to act where we need to act, but also, Lord, uh, help us not be um, fooled into thinking it's all up to us to get everything right. 
So Lord, would you, uh, would you be with us as we dig into this passage this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And so chapter 3 ended talking about how Christ suffered while he was being obedient to the will of God, talking about Christ being crucified, suffering pain uh, while he was being obedient to God's will. And Peter begins chapter 4 by saying, uh, as suffering and persecution are on the rise in the Roman Empire, now Christians need to take on that same attitude of Christ. We need to arm ourselves with the same mindset of Jesus who was willing to endure the suffering that came as he sought to fulfill the will of God. He's saying, arm yourself, equip yourself for battle as the challenges are going to come. The suffering is on the horizon and equip yourself with the mindset of Christ. Arm yourself with, the mind, with, with uh, your mind and your eyes set on what we've seen in Christ. And he continues in verse two. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human desires, but rather for the will of God. So Peter's saying, if you, if you arm yourself with this attitude of Christ, as a result of arming ourselves with this attitude, Christians will begin to live for the will of God rather than to live for their own selfish and evil desires. So he's saying downstream of arming ourselves with this attitude is a, a different way of living. And he says this very quickly and very plainly, uh, but, but we know that this is easier said than done. Peter, the guy writing this, knows this. He lived in the tension. You, you may remember as, as Jesus was being crucified, someone recognized him and said, hey, you're one of Jesus's friends. And Peter denied knowing Jesus as he was, he was there at that crossroads of do I, do I be obedient to God or do I serve these self-protected desires in me? Peter has lived within that tension and he writes to someone who knows that tension. And Peter is saying here, we are all confronted with this choice. Not just one time, but, but daily, maybe hourly. Do we live for the evil human desires within us, or do we live for the will of God? Big question. And a quick aside, not, not every desire that we as humans have is evil. Uh, in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, when God creates the world and humanity, uh, he creates in us, we are created in his image. He creates good desires, desires to love and care for others, desires for unity, reconciliation. There are many human desires that are reflective of this image of God in us and that have been given to us by God and come to us naturally. And they're not set at odds with the will of God. But there are also some human desires that we all have naturally and they're evil human desires. And these are the ones Peter's referencing. And these desires do run counter to the will of God. They're set in opposition to God's will. And they're oriented towards rebellion, oriented towards destruction. And these desires have their heritage in Genesis 3, the fall. And Peter again is saying, we are confronted daily with this question of what it is we will live for. Will we live for the service of these evil human desires or will we live for the service of God's will? And this is a battle going on within each of our hearts and at a cosmic level. This, this battle for who or what we will live for, what or who we will depend on. And this is nothing new. Again, we, we saw it in Genesis 3 and it's woven throughout the Old Testament, throughout the, the stories of the lives of people of Israel, throughout Peter's life like we talked about. Uh, will we depend on God, or will we depend on ourselves or the other gods around us? If you look in uh, the book of Joshua, Joshua is one of the, the leaders of Israel after Moses. And essentially on his deathbed, he gave this speech in Joshua chapter 24, which points out to the same like crossroads, the same decision point that Joshua sees in the midst of Israel's history. He says in Joshua 24, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. 
But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That may be on a plaque in your kitchen somewhere. The me and my household, we will serve the Lord, not the Amorites part. (laughs) And Peter encourages us to set our hope in Christ and to let go of these other things we may lean on for our hope, these other things we may depend on, these other things we may build our lives around, things like our reputation or security or control or, or the pursuit of pleasure. And, and the, the beautiful mystery of God is, is that in, in letting go of these things, which sometimes seem so painful and difficult, God will lead us to what our hearts are really made to long for. A few, few hundred years after Peter wrote this letter, there was a, a Christian named Augustine who lived, uh, he was a bishop, and he <clears throat> uh, wrote this famous line. He said, God is always trying to give good things to us but our hands are too full to receive them. God is always trying to give good things to us, but our hands are too full to receive them. And a lot of times it's not a hand that's just full of, of, of stuff, it's a hand that's, that's holding on, a hand that is, is grasping to things. And Peter tells us, let, let those things go. And the scary question that hopefully you're all thinking right now is, if I let these things go, will my hands be filled again? Or will, will I be left empty-handed? And again, we look at Christ, who emptied himself, who let go of his own life, and gave himself even unto death, yet it was from that death that, that new life was born. And so it is with the Christian. Jesus tells us that whoever loses their life for his sake will find it. Whoever lays down their own vision for life, their own selfish desires, and takes up Jesus' vision will not only find life, but will find life to the full. This may not have been summed up better by anyone than C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. He wrote, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. But look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Peter continues in verse 3, for you have spent enough time in the, you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, whatever that is, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you not that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And so Peter writes this, again, to Christians living in a society where a lot of the behavior on this list was not just tolerated, but it was openly practiced by a lot of respectable people. Uh, Openly practiced and not not a fringe thing. It was a part of many rituals. Orgies were part of many rituals for local religions. And Peter is saying to these Christians, I know many of you lived like this before you became a Christian. I know everyone around you is still doing it. Everyone around you is expecting you to do it and urging you to continue. And maybe there's a part of you that wants to continue. But as Christians, it's time to leave that way of living behind because it's contrary to the will of God and it's contrary to God's will for us. And as we read this list, uh, if if this is a part of our life as a Christian, that, that should convict us. But there's a little more to this, this passage for us as readers today in 2023. It should lead us to ask if there are things we do or things we've been doing as Christians that, that our culture accepts, that our culture says is normal, and that respectable people around us are doing, uh, but that are evil and that we need to leave in the past because they're contrary to the will of God. I think about things like if if, if you're making a business deal where maybe, you know, part of, part, you get a little skim off the edge, or maybe it's a deal that you know is terrible for the other people and is going to, like, ruin their business, but, but you do it because that's, that's business, baby, and that's just what you do. And so you go along because that's what everyone expects of you, and that's acceptable practice, but it's wrong. Or maybe doctors uh, where you're getting pressure from above to do an extra test or, so you can bill a little more because... Uh, you know, that's just, we all got quotas to meet, and so we just do this thing we don't need to do. 
What about a realtor if you know there's a problem with the house and you're not going to, uh, the question of do you tell the home buyer or not? Because uh, on one hand, it's, you know, uh, if, if you don't sell it to them, you'll sell it to someone else. And um, that's just how business is done, like I said. And to be fair, what about a pastor? Uh, pastors, uh, it, you can build your brand, build a personal following with the idea that, wow, this would increase your influence. Uh, this would get people to church. Society would accept that. Um, and Peter tells us that we're all faced with these choices. And, and then he says in verse 4 that, that sometimes when we're obedient to God and we follow God's will in the, in the midst of these choices, we will not be rewarded. We will not be recognized. The time may come when not joining in leads to you paying a price. It might lead to you losing the deal. Might, might lead to our pediatrician um, had to take another job because she was getting the pressure from the, the quotas up top to where she had to get patients in and out in 10 minutes. And she said, that's not why I got into this. May lead to you not being respected in your field. May lead to people thinking you're a mediocre pastor. And Peter tells us that when this happens, not if this happens, but when it happens, to arm ourselves with the same attitude as Christ, who again resolved to obey God rather than to sin, even if it meant suffering. And like I said, I've said it many times already, but Peter's readers and we face this, this daily choice of this path of least resistance or obeying God and, and possibly suffering ridicule. And Peter gives a word to that in verse 5. He says, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So when the ridicule comes, Peter says, you don't have to fight and win that battle. Peter says, trust God with that. Trust God that they will have to answer for what they've done. Leave it to God. You focus on where your hope is set. You focus on being obedient and let God handle the rest. And so I'll step back for a moment right here. Um, if, you didn't know the, if, if you didn't know the bigger picture, you, this may sound like a classic, you know, just stop sinning sermon. Uh, what's the big deal? Just stop sinning. Uh, but to be clear, the gospel, the gospel is not that, that Jesus died for you, so now you can go show that you're good enough and you can go earn it. Have to remember, this letter was written to Christians. And there's a difference between salvation and sanctification. Salvation is where we're, we're rescued uh, by no work of our own. We're saved from the punishment of our, our, our rebellion and the, the punishment we deserve. That's salvation. When you become a Christian, you are saved and it is over. Um, you have received eternal life. Sanctification is what takes place after that. And that's where a Christian is gradually transformed into a more holy and Christ-like person. And Peter here is writing about sanctification for Christians. Again, he's writing to churches. He's writing to Christians, writing about sanctification because we are called to follow Jesus. And, and sanctification is the process that helps us live a life worthy of that calling we receive. And so thankfully, though, Peter does give us some practical direction on how do we do this? How do we live for the will of God? And this is, we'll go rapid fire through these and then we'll, uh, then we'll be done. Verse 7, he says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. So Peter says three times in 1 Peter to be sober-minded. And in, in chapter 5, he says, Be sober-minded because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so Peter says, you got to be sharp. You got to be sober minded. You got to be collected, level headed, clear minded. You have to know that there's a battle going on at every one of those crossroads between being obedient to God and pursuing our own evil desires. We have to see that for what it is uh, and be aware of what's going on and pray, not just march to the beat of the drum. Verse 8, Peter says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And so again, here, we take on the same attitude as Christ. In John 13, Jesus says, I have loved you, so you must love one another. Life together as Christians is messy. And, and Peter here is saying, let love guide your life. Take on that attitude of Christ. In verse 9, 
Peter says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. This one hit home. Why do we grumble? Um, a lot of times when, we, when we're hospitable to people and we grumble, it's because our will is being encroached upon. There are things we want, th- ways we want things done that's being pressed in on a little bit. And Peter encourages us, hey, offer hospitality without grumbling. It's almost like he knows. It's almost like he's had someone stay in his house before. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. And this is an exciting one. God has given each of us gifts. Think of the thing you're good at and go and do that thing. How do we do, how do we use these gifts? How do we do that thing for the the benefit of the kingdom and for the benefit of others? This is a fun challenge. And the key within it is that it's a gift God has given us, a gift we have received. They're not our gifts. And so use those to serve others and serve God, not ourselves. If you don't know what your gift is, hang on. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. So this is really about knowing the weight of your words, both for good and for evil. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So our words can pierce like a sword, or they can bring healing like an ointment. That is the power of words. And so so Peter says, Do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Recognize the weight of the Holy Spirit speaking through you. 11b, or the second half of 11. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So serving is one more way that we follow in the steps of Jesus. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. So if you don't know what your gift is, if you, if you don't know how to use that for the kingdom, I'd just say find a way to serve and trust that that will, that will become clear as you serve. Because we serve not, like as Peter says here, not with our own strength, but with God's strength, the strength God will provide. And we serve not to bring ourselves praise, not so everyone sees us serving, but to bring God praise. And so again, if you're looking for a step, I'd encourage you to take a step towards serving and will orient your life towards being a part of what God is doing in the lives of others. There's a time for introspection and a time for a personal inventory, but there's also time to just go out and serve. And if you're looking for a way to serve, as Bob mentioned earlier, there is a QR code on the back of the chair in front of you, and if you scan that on your phone with your camera, a little link will pop up, and there are a bunch of different ways that you can uh, connect and get served and, and start serving easily available there. Uh, So I'd encourage you, again, serve as we follow in the steps of Jesus who came as a servant. So now, I will close. This whole series, we've been doing a no and we've been doing a do. And I'll close with a no and a do for the sermon. No, what do we need to know? We need to know that we live in a world of competing hopes, a world of competing wills. Our will, others' will, and God's will. We need to know that setting our hope on Jesus and living a life for him will bring us true life. It'll bring us true peace. It'll bring us true purpose. And to do, I'd encourage you, this list of five we just went through, verses seven through 11. Is there something in that list you could take a step towards? As we read through through those, was there one that grabbed you? Take a step in that direction. Maybe that's joining a, a serve team on the QR code on the back of the chair. Maybe it is taking an inventory of of what you're doing on a day-to-day basis that maybe is deemed okay by society, Uh, but really asking the question, is that how God wants me to live? There's your no, there's your do. Um, Would you join me in prayer as we consider all this? Lord, we we thank you for the work you completed and finished on the cross, laying down your life for us and bringing us redemption um, through your death, bringing us new life through the perfect life life you lived and laid down on our behalf. Lord, help us know that uh, when it comes to our salvation, you are the beginning and the end, and you have completed it, Lord. But I also thank you for, for not just leaving us there, 
um, but caring enough to redeem and purify and uh, restore the parts of us that have been broken by life, that were broken in Genesis 3, Lord. Thank you for, for caring enough uh, to wish for our good. And so, Lord, help us, help us take steps towards, uh, towards growth and becoming more like you. Help us take steps towards sanctification uh, but all the while, Lord, I pray and, and ask that, that we remember that it is you working in us. Uh, we cannot heal ourselves. We need the healer. Right? And so, Lord, help us freely step forward in sanctification, led by you, um, not by a sense of guilt, um, but by a sense of excitement and hope for the new life that you want for us, Lord. Um, as all these things in your son Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us as we uh, respond. Worship. God of creation, there at the star before the beginning. Point of reference, I spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. The vapor of your breath, the quiver. The stars were made to worship so high. I can see your heart in everything you speak. Every burning star is signal fire of faith. If creation sings your praises so high. So
encourage you again, QR code back of your chair if you're looking for a way to serve or take a step towards getting involved. But let's go with these words from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. <laughs> 